Hello again. Let's take a look at some comparisons, some contrasts of prokary uh, prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. Let's take a look at a few characteristics. Um, let's see, I have eight altogether that I'd like you to consider that we might think of as key distinctions uh, between these two groups of cells. All right, and then I want to talk to you a little bit about an interesting concept called endosymbiotic theory. Let's take a look. First of all, what's that primary distinction? What's the primary difference between these two types of cells? The prokaryotic bacteria and archaea are different from eukaryotic cells in a number of different um, aspects, features of cell type. But the key difference is going to be that we have cells with a nucleus, right? Eukaryotic cell. Look at that nice um, fluorescent microscopy image of a eukaryotic cell. Prokaryotic cells. No nucleus in this cell, all right? And then if we think about them in terms of their relationship to each other, look at this size difference. The large pink eukaryotic cell with its distinct nucleus as opposed to the smaller, much smaller, as you can see, prokaryotic cells that are in this image. So eukaryotic cells, prokaryotic cells, key difference was the presence of a nucleus, but you can see distinctively different in their relative sizes. All right, so that was the first key differential characteristic. Does the organism have its DNA, its hereditary material, inside a membranous organelle structure? Well, in the case of the prokaryotic cell, they do not. They have their DNA localized in a region called the nucleoid, but this nucleoid does not possess any kind of membrane structure. Eukaryotic cells do have this membrane-bound organelle called the nucleus, which is the center, the location where the DNA of the cell is concentrated. Now, what we expect to find is that in the prokaryotic cell, we're going to have <clears throat> less DNA, excuse me, and in the eukaryotic cell we tend to have much more DNA. So that'll be a distinction also in terms of the amount of DNA we find in these locations. Now, prokaryotic cells, we say, do not possess membrane-bound organelles. All right, think about the overview of cell differences, and one of the things you, I'm sure, remember about eukaryotic cells is that they have lots of compartments, lots of membrane-bound organelles. Prokaryotic cells don't have that, which means that the prokaryotic cell's plasma membrane is going to have to be responsible for carrying out all membrane-related activities. And in some prokaryotic cells, the plasma membrane folds in on itself, creates a series of pleated folds, and by doing so, creates a small region of distinct chemistry. Remember what organelles are basically doing creating compartments with different kinds of aqueous solutions on two sides of the membrane. Well, these mesosome structures that some prokaryotic cells produce, infoldings of the plasma membrane, in a sense, are acting like the organelles of a eukaryotic cell. But we still consider it to not be a true organelle. Now, eukaryotic cells are known for their high number of membrane-bound organelles, each with its own particular specialized function and, of course, an associated specialized structure. What's another distinction? Well, if we look at the DNA of the two types of organisms, we find that in both cases, the DNA has to be packaged. It has to be wound around protein. Oh, I guess you could think of them as being like the spools that you wind thread around. I have to have some way of taking the very long DNA molecule for a little bacterial cell that's one micrometer long, it might have a meter of DNA in it. If I take the DNA out of one of your cells, I would find six feet of DNA in just one of your cells. Now, I know that seems hard to imagine, but what it convinces us of is that the DNA of both prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells needs to be wound tightly and packaged so that it can fit inside the cell. Well, in the case of the prokaryotic cell, the DNA is wound around what are called non-histone proteins. And histone proteins are an important family, a family of proteins that are specifically used for the packaging of, that's right, eukaryotic DNA. So, another distinction. We have DNA in the eukaryotic cell wound around histone spools, 
in the case of the prokaryotic cell, wound around another family of proteins. One other distinction is that the prokaryotic cell, we expect to find one circular chromosome, one circular piece of DNA. In the case of the eukaryotic cell, it's much more common to find multiple linear pieces of DNA. So another distinction. Notice this distinction is in terms of DNA packaging. All right, let's consider what else. Cell walls. Well, prokaryotic cells commonly have cell walls. They don't all have cell walls, but when they do have a cell wall, it's either going to be composed of a complex molecular structure called peptidoglycan, that's in bacteria, or pseudopeptidoglycan found in the archaea. Now, we just never find that molecular structure in eukaryotic cells. So even if we do have a eukaryotic cell that has a cell wall, something like a plant or a fungi, what we find is a different kind of chemical composition. And instead, we find that plants, their primary constituent making up their cell walls is cellulose, and the primary constituent making up the cell walls of fungi is a molecule called chitin. By the way, notice that both prokaryotic and eukaryotic organisms use carbohydrate molecules built into a mesh-like structure as their wall material. So let me say that again. Key component of all walls is what? Carbohydrates. With what else? With protein chains mixed in. So if I looked at the fungal cell wall, the plant cell wall, and either of the prokaryotic cell walls, I'd find them to be made out of some kind of carbohydrate protein mixture, a complex of those two long chain molecules. All right, so think about that. Look, commonality and basic structure, but key distinctive features for these different groups of organisms. All right, so prokaryotics have a very simplified mechanism of reproduction. Basically, the cell just splits into two. It's called binary fission. The DNA of the cell, the one circular chromosome is copied, and the cell pulls into two cells, and basically it's done. Very simple in terms of the, the steps involved in comparison to what eukaryotic cells do. Eukaryotic cells carry out two specialized forms of cell division, one called mitosis, the other one called meiosis or meiosis. And in both cases, those are much more complicated events. Many more proteins involved, specialized structures that are built just during the cell division process. Since the eukaryotic cell has multiple linear chromosomes, much more DNA material has to become organized and separated. So when we look at the basic process of cell reproduction, one cell giving rise to two cells, we see that in prokaryotic organisms, that process is relatively simple and called binary fission. That process in eukaryotic cells is a more complicated event, and we're going to see later, when we look at the individual steps of both mitosis and meiosis, that it's a organized process of dividing the multiple pieces of DNA that the eukaryotic cell has. Another important key distinction between these two cell types. When we look at the organelles of these two cell types, we find that they both have ribosomes. And you're going to want to find, and you will find as you read this chapter, as you listen to more material, what ribosomes do. And we could talk about them in a basic way as place, places within the cell, uh, organelle responsible for the production of proteins. And that will be a simple definition we can use right now. Later, when we deal more with genetics and nucleic acids and so forth later in the semester, then you're going to find that we're going to talk a little bit more detail about the ribosome structure and exactly what its role is in protein production. Okay, enough said about that. What about prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells? What we find is that when we look at their ribosomes, even though they have the same function, they have distinctive structures. You can compare them and see a number of differences in the molecular makeup of these ribosomes. What's a way to generalize this? Well, the designation 70S versus ADS is one way to generalize the difference between the ribosomes of prokaryotic cells, 70S. Think of that as representing that the ribosome is a smaller structure. You don't really have to worry about the details of what that 70S means exactly. Just think of it as prokaryotic ribosomes are a smaller ribosome. Eukary eukaryotic ribosomes, ADS ribosomes, are a larger structure. They have more components. So there is that difference number of component differences in the structure of the ribosome, even though the ribosomes in both types of cells 
have more or less the same function, building polypeptides. All right, so now what else about bacterial or prokaryotic cells could we talk about? Well, one of the things is that they don't have the ability to carry out what's called endocytosis. And we'll spend quite a bit of time on this process later in our discussion of eukaryotic cells. And we're going to find, however, that even though these bacteria, prokaryotic cells, can't do endocytosis, they do have specialized transport mechanisms that are called group translocation. So the eukaryotic cells do have the ability to do endocytosis, but they lack the capacity to do group translocation. So notice here we're looking at specific features that are different in how the membranes of these two cells work. One of the distinctions, even though they both have cell membranes, even though they both need to move materials through those cell membranes, we're going to see differences in their abilities to carry out those different types of cell transport. Finally, we find that both kinds of cells have flagella. And a flagella is a structure used for moving a cell. But there's an interesting difference between the two of them. Even though we might think of them as superficially being similar, their composition is quite different. One of them is made of a little globular protein called flagellin, the bacterial, the prokaryotic uh, flagella. And the flagella found in eukaryotic cells are made out of hollow tube-like protein structures that are called microtubules. Another distinction is that the prokaryotic flagellum rotates almost like at the propeller of a boat. And it spins. It actually has a wheel-like structure. And I hope you'll have an opportunity, either in this class or another class, to take a look at the structure of that bacterial flagellum wheel. Eukaryotic flagella bend. They move in a wave-like motion, a whip-like motion. So even though superficially they look similar, their structure and the way in which they function is quite different. All right, so finally, that idea I mentioned to you, endosymbiosis. People noticed as they were studying the organelles of eukaryotic cells that they had a number of interesting features. And what they suggested was that the organelles, at least some of the organelles of the eukaryotic cell, may have at one time been free-living prokaryotic cells, some type of bacterial cell possibly. Now that's an interesting idea, and as you can imagine when it was first suggested, it was considered to be very radical and wasn't well accepted initially. Today, people are more or less convinced that that's probably the right explanation. Let me give you a few pieces of information that are used to try to support the idea that, notice what I'm saying, that some of the organelles found in eukaryotic cells were, they are today the descendants of bacterial cells that had gotten into primitive eukaryotic cells well in the past. What are two organelles that have some of these features that cause people to draw this conclusion? The mitochondrion and the chloroplast. So mitochondria and chloroplast have some interesting features. Take a look at them and see what you think. First of all, mitochondria and chloroplast have their own DNA and it's circular DNA and it's packaged just as you would expect DNA to be packaged but here it's packaged with non-histone proteins. Remember we're talking about DNA inside of an organelle that's inside of a eukaryotic cell. It has its own DNA and notice circular like the prokaryotic cell. Mitochondria and chloroplasts can increase in number in the cell, but interestingly enough, they do it in a way that's very reminiscent of, very similar to, binary fission. Once again, that suggests something like a prokaryote, doesn't it? Each of these organelles has some of its own organelles. That seems strange, doesn't it? But mitochondria and chloroplasts have their own ribosomes. And when you look at the structure of their ribosomes, guess what kind of structure they have? They're 70S ribosomes. And then both the mitochondria and the chloroplasts have a double membrane system surrounding, creating the surface of the organelle. And that kind of double membrane arrangement is something that we find in some major groups, some large groups of bacterial cells. So you can see that these pieces of evidence, and these are only four of a number of other pieces of evidence, that people have used to try to make the argument, try to support the idea, that 
organelles, some of them, at least the mitochondria and chloroplasts, are the descendants of ancient prokaryotic cells that moved into eukaryotic cells and set up an endo inside symbiosis, living together. It's a really interesting idea, and I think you might want to do a search or something like that to explore it further. I'll talk more about it this semester, though. All right, so what have we looked at here? I tried to go through what I consider to be eight key differences that we can use to contrast prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. Realize that there were a number of cases where we talked about them having common features. They both have ribosomes, for example. Both have plasma membranes that have specialized transport functions. They both have DNA. They both have cell division. But it was the distinctions in those activities, those structures, that allowed us to separate the prokaryotic from the eukaryotic cell. And then finally, I suggested that interesting idea to you of endosymbiosis, that maybe some organelles had as ancestors prokaryotic cells, bacterial cells that moved inside of a eukaryotic cell and lived within the cell. Thanks very much. I hope you found this interesting. I'll talk to you next time.